Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 10, Episode 125. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazor, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being here this Friday, Steelers Nation. Dave, how you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, how how are the accommodations in your bubble? <laughs> <laughs> the food is uh, better than Orlando, it appears. That is some Fry Festival type food the NBA is experiencing. Yeah, it looked like you stopped off at an airport and picked up uh, something <laughs> in the uh, in, in 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 one of those news stores or whatnot. You know, uh, right? Uh, yeah, my food's a lot better uh, in my bubble than than it seems like that is. Yeah, um, and and speaking of bubbles, you know we're getting closer to the start of season. MLB has their first, I think, opening day July twenty third. As the sports world tries to ramp back up, and TJ Watt jumped on ninety three seven the fan. Is there a train greeting me? Yep, there's a train greeting me to start the podcast. I think it's a little quiet one this time. Anyway, TJ Watt jumped on ninety three seven the fan to talk about his reaction to the sports world, the NFL trying to start, and if fans will be there. Steelers have some news about that. We'll touch on in a second, but. T.J. Watt just said players will have to adapt and adjust if, if fans aren't there, reduce capacity or whatever the scenario is. And, and that's all really I think he can say at this point. Every team's going to have to deal with it, and there's not a whole lot of players can do about it. They just have to go out there and still do their job. Yeah, he was uh, he was kind of blunt, short, and to, you know, to the point with that and about, you know uh, – uh, I mean, I don't know what else to really to add that 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 you know that he he had to say about that. I mean, you just it's just one of those things that you have to overcome. Now, obviously, we still hope uh, that 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 fans, you know, some amount of fans or what percentage we don't know uh, if any right now. But assuming things stay on plan, uh, you know, the way things are right now, you know, the Ravens are looking like they might allow. You know, somewhere up to maybe around fourteen thousand or so fans at their games. You have to you have to think the Steelers would be somewhere close in line uh, with that. Uh, but uh, you know, look, obviously these things can change in a hurry. So what we say today might become out of date by the time people listen to this late, if they listen to this later on tonight here. So yeah, not really much to add to what TJ had to say about the fan aspect of uh, of games. And I should pivot here, but I should have let off with this because this is probably the biggest news since we uh, last did our, our, our previous show, Dave, was that the Steelers sent emails out to season ticket holders trying to give some sort of framing for what the, the, the organization is expecting as of right now. And as you said, things can change so quickly that nothing's set in stone. But they sent an email, and in part it says, quote, as for the regular season, we are working with public health officials in the NFL on plans for fans to safely attend the games. Our goal is to have fans at Heinz Field this season. We anticipate that we will, we will be working with a reduced capacity scenario and that fans will be required to wear masks. We will provide more information on the regular season plans once they are finalized. So even if fans are there, it'll be reduced capacity, as you said, maybe a Baltimore-type situation, and that fans uh, will be required to wear masks. So so that's where we sit right now in terms of, of Steelers Nation and Steelers fans potentially being there. Uh, in Western PA, cases have gone up. They've kind of rolled back some of the reopening. I know Allegheny County, uh, you know, bars and, and, and restaurants, dine-in have to close, and I think it's going to start expanding to other counties. You know, I'm in Westmoreland County right next to it. They're, they're close to doing the same and starting to roll back things as well. So everything's kind of up in the air, but the best case scenario seems to be that reduced capacity and that fans will, of course, have to wear masks to attend Heinz Field this, this season. Yeah, boy, uh, you, you said a mouthful there. By the way, 66 days until the Steelers' regular season opener uh, on the road against the uh, the New York football giants. And uh, speaking of 66, you know, there's just not a lot of uh, uh, big plays that the Steelers have had over the years. That have gone 66 yards. Mm. I don't, I don't no, know give what. Me, give me a give me a DeCastro pancake for 66. Uh, yeah, that would that would be nice. Uh, Antoine Randall L was the last uh, Steelers player to have, by the way, a 66 yard uh, touchdown there, and that was in 2003 in the playoff game. Uh, uh, that, that wild playoff game against the Cleveland Browns. I was actually in Vegas uh, for uh, uh, during that game. Uh, in, in in it was actually two th- January of 2000 and three, but it was a 2002, 2003 playoff uh, game. Uh, that was the wacky one. The Steelers came back to win 36 to 
to 33. Prior to that, you have to go all the way back to 1967 for a 66-yard touchdown by the Steelers. And the funny thing about it, uh, of the six plays here of 66 yards in the Steelers' history that have gone for 66 yards and a touchdown, four of them have come against the Giants. Hmm. Uh, that's, that's weird. And so with that, I will predict that the Steelers opener will include a 66 yard touchdown. So go ahead and write that one down. I'm, I'm, I'm that blo- first play of the game. You've already called first. Well, play you of the know game. what, uh, what, what is that? Uh, you would, you would probably, you would probably have somebody come over here and, and, uh, you'd probably have a priest come over here if I'm right on that. Right? <laughs> uh, Get you? the holy water. Right there, there you go. 66 oh. yard, uh, deep touchdown. First play of the game for the Steelers against the Giants. Although the problem with that is just assume the Steelers' kick return gets uh, out to the 34, which seems like a mountain at this point. There you go. Maybe maybe they'll fumble forward or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe a kick out of bounds or a squid kick or something. That's the best chance at this point. There you go. Now, where, where were we on this thing before I rudely interrupted you? <laughs> uh, just talking about Steelers, fans, Steelers organization sending Nemo to fans saying that best case scenario, basically reduced capacity. Fans will have to be required to wear masks, and, and that's – the optimal you know scenario right now is as bad as that sounds yeah and i guess where i was going with that is we still got 66 days so uh you know a lot can a lot can change and you know it so close yet so far away you know mm-hmm. so uh you know maybe maybe you know we'll, we'll come out of this you know resurgence or whatnot and and you know, maybe the numbers will start going the other way and stay down, you know. So still a lot of time here. Obviously got a full training camp and all uh, to go ahead of that. But at least at least we got we have some semblance, maybe, of uh, what, what it's looking like or a better mm-hmm. semblance of what it's looking like. Yeah, it's not looking too great. Right now, also been talking about players potentially being able to opt out of the season if they don't feel comfortable, if they're high risk, if there's someone in their immediate family who is high risk. And I would expect that some small percentage of players would opt out. We've seen that in baseball. We've seen that in basketball. Um, probably see it in football, too, given how many players there are. Yeah, you would think it would be the higher earners if there were, you know. Uh, well, I don't know if it's if it's a money thing. I think it's just into whoever feels like they're not comfortable, they're just at risk, and I think that could be a variety of different players. Yeah, but if you're if you're a roster bubble player, you know, uh, bottom end of the roster, and, and you're thinking, well, I'm, I might sit out this season, you might not be back. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I look at the Pirates, and they just had a reliever, 33 years old, very much on the bubble, minor leaguer type guy that just opted out and decided against it. So, I mean, I think for the player that doesn't have any – uh, greater risk that you know if they were a bubble guy they're going to opt in but if they have some sort of higher risk or a family member with high risk or some sort of family situation I, that, that person could still opt out i could see it yeah uh I, you know obviously the hope uh, from the nfl side is that you know none you know none none will have to you know mm-hmm. but uh you know i think you definitely in uh, uh considering what's in you know the risk and all that that's involved you know you you got to give them an option too, so mm-hmm. uh, we'll see. Uh, look, I mean, here we are Friday. I was hoping by now we would have a lot more things kind of set in stone from the league, you know, uh, c- concerning you know maybe operations from for training camp and roster size number and pre and look, we still don't have an official word on preseason, do we? I mean, we have nope. the report that the preseason is going to be cut in half, but uh, unless I missed it, I don't think the league has come out and said, hey, the preseason's cut in half. Right. The only thing that's been determined is no jersey swaps post game. So well, thank God we got that one out of the way. Important issues of the game. Yeah. yeah. yeah only thank, thing I know so far. Yeah. Thank God we had that one out of the way. Uh, uh, look, I mean, still got a lot to de- to, to be decided here, and you no, know, and, and, and and until that is, we're going to be filling time with a lot of speculation. It feels like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not, just not much time for them to figure this out. You got 18 days till training camp. I mean, you have what? What's the Steelers' first preseason game? August 3rd or something? In, in terms of this, the, the original schedule. Oh uh, yeah, day. yeah. But obviously, if that's push push back, there right? Be- but I'm just saying, like, how right. you know we're, we're less than a month away from the schedule for a preseason game. Obviously, to make a decision well in advance of that, so like the clock is ticking, and if you got to get your button gear, right? And it, look, especially with training camp pro- protocol, you know, uh, uh, as far as that goes, I mean, because these guys are going to have to start getting a better idea of what's going to be expected of, of them. And really for the, for the most part for, 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 for preseason as well too, you know, how, mm. how quickly I look, I've said this all along. I know it's not been popular, but I, I the way I think it's going to be play out. Or, uh, uh, and I think the two sides, what's going on there is, and, and somehow the, the players association will mess this up and give in to something here. 
They always do. Uh, but I, you know, I'm sure the NFL is kind of holding this as a bargaining chip with uh, the complete preseason. Uh, you know, pre- the, I'm sure they're willing to, 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 to have at least two games here, but I, I bet that the NFL is trying to hold on to these final two preseason games as some sort of bargaining chip to get something else uh, here, and I bet you whatever that else is, they get it. <laughs> mm-hmm. I you think know? there was a report from Jeremy Fowler that said the NFL PA may – give the NFL two preseason games in exchange for something else. So it certainly is uh, something on, on the table to be negotiated. I personally think at this point right now, they should cancel all of it and then just get use the acclimation period. You use the extra uh, time during during training camp to get a uh, proper acclimation period and make sure your players get into the regular season in as good as of health as possible. Once again, I know that's not popular, but, but I, I – I personally believe that, that we've gotten to this point that that should be the plan. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what the NFLPA is pushing. They want uh, – if they could get it their way, there would be no preseason. But I think it's a little hypocritical for the NFLPA to say it is not safe to play any preseason game, but let's go ahead and play a full 16-game schedule plus playoffs. I think if you're going to argue for cutting the preseason because it's just not safe, then you got to be arguing for some sort of reduction in the regular season as well. Yeah, I view it more as not safe just beyond just because of the getting them ramped up properly. Yeah, know, but I go back to 2011, and I don't right. think there was an issue back. In, but I mean, but but to your point, to be fair, to bring it back to T.J. Watt, which is how I started things. I mean, he says, uh, "quote So I think there definitely needs to be some sort of acclimation period when we're able to get conditioned in the right shape to play football. Because, like I said, some people are working extremely hard, and some guys probably aren't working as hard as they should be. So, yeah, I mean, you want guys to get ramped up, but if you report to camp on the 28th, your first preseason game isn't till two two and a half weeks after that. I mean, I think that's enough time. There were TJ fired a couple of shots at, at either a few of his teammates or people across the league the other day, mm-hmm. uh, and I'm glad he kind of left it open ended so it doesn't become uh, major news there. But uh, uh, him and really you know a few other Steelers have as well uh, sort of you know uh, reading in between the lines that there's some people out there right now that probably don't want. Uh, the season to start on time because, uh, you know, look, these guys know what each other do for the most part. I'm willing to bet you. I mean, it's easy yep. enough to follow a lot of these guys on Instagram. Not that, not that uh, it means anything. The guy who updates the most is in the best shape. You know, because there's obviously guys out there just don't give a crap about social media and good on them if they're those guys. Uh, But I'm willing to bet word circulates throughout the league and in these group texts and all like that of who may or may not be doing what they're supposed to be doing about right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, there's hard workers. There's players who don't work as hard. I mean, there's players who probably tried to to dog it and get out of stuff during the season. You know, when you're just trying to avoid practice, you're not really, you know, working out as hard as you could be. And you can imagine what it's like when you're really by yourself. So, yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that there are players and I'm sure some Steelers that are just not putting in the same amount of work they would be in a regular offseason. Some, uh, some, you know, some people work better with uh, defined, you know, instruction you know mm-hmm. a, a la otas and and all season condition you know, show up here and we'll get you in shape kind of things others uh, you know what i'm getting at is some need that kind of direction sure. uh, uh instruction through their life and I, I and i imagine there is a probably a larger than normal uh set of of guys out there not only on the steeders but 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 league wide that probably aren't where they need to be uh in a phys- physical physical condition you know side of things right now mm-hmm. yeah i agree now the good thing is at least obviously they're able to talk to coaches they're able to have a plan you know, able to get instructions from strength and strength excuse me strength and conditioning coaches like gary guimont marcel pastor and all that which is a difference from 2011 because in 11 i mean you couldn't talk to anyone you couldn't talk to your coach i mean you just went around because of the lockout so you couldn't have any sort of plan any sort of instruction they still got through you know the preseason and all that obviously different set of circumstances I understand uh, the, the, the vast differences there but at least there is some level of direction but you're right some players just left to their own devices you still have to put that plan in action some guys aren't going to work as hard as other uh, as others you know at least back in 2011 they could go to their gym of their choice probably and do what mm-hmm. they needed to do right. probably not all of them could do that you know some of these poor rookies out there just can't afford you know their own in-house weights or don't have a you know there are there were a lot of challenges for especially a lot of younger guys now the older guys 
you know, and that's why I, I think, and look, I mean, we saw uh, uh, some social media throughout the offseason of Cameron Hayward having some guy. you know, Cameron Hayward basically has a gym, I think, in his house now, you know, uh, 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 you know, with, with different types of equipment in there. You know, I, I you really got to take your hat off and hand it to a lot of these older veterans that kind of took some of these younger guys in and, you know, gave them a place to work out and that kind of thing. And if you're a younger guy, you needed to probably took it, take it upon yourself to seek that kind of stuff out. You know, yeah, absolutely. So a lot of challenges for for the uh, season whenever it starts, whenever things ramp up, and that is certainly going to be one of them. TJ Watts, anything else from the uh, fan interview that kind of caught your ear, Dave? Oh, I just like the praise that he gave uh, his teammates. You know, talking about Bud Dupree and you know how, how Bud Dupree is one of the hardest you know working guys he's he's ever ever seen. Uh, gave some uh, some uh, uh, you know he's really excited about you know asked. He was asked specifically about about uh, you know how he expects guys like Devin Bush and Mika Fitzpatrick to to you know kind of take that next step, if you will, in their second seasons. And you know he thinks they'll do just that. Look, you know they they you know he went on to say about uh, Mika. He says I think we all kind of look past the fact that. He did not know the playbook when he first got there in week two or three, whenever it was, Watt said of Fitzpatrick. And to be able to step in and play as well as he did, I'm just super excited because now he knows the whole playbook. He knows everybody. He knows the communication. And it's going to be an exciting year. Uh, he's really excited about him. As far as Devin goes, he thinks, uh, I think for Devin, it's huge just to have a full offseason under his belt with all the rookie meetings and all the combine prep and everything like that. Uh, he knows what he's expecting going into camp. He knows the playbook book he knows the speed of the game so i'm so i'm excited to just get more communication out of him and to step up in a leadership role there so you know, a lot of things that we've talked about most of most of the offseason here alex about reasons why just you know another reason why it's okay to be excited about the prospects of this defense possibly being as good if not better hopefully than uh, what we've seen since uh, 2008 Mm -hmm. And I think that's an excellent point by Watt, and we shouldn't overlook the fact that Minka got traded on, what, like a Tuesday or something? It was a Tuesday night, 10, 11 o'clock, the news broke, and the dude's starting by that Sunday and plays excellent against the 49ers. And so can't uh, understate how difficult of a transition that is. Even if the Seals don't have the most complex and complicated playbook, and they probably kept things relatively simple for Minka, but the fact he was able to do that, head spinning, living in a new place, still a young guy. I mean, 23-year-old, you know, moving like that. Uh, new organization, new face, it's got to find a new apartment, all that stuff related to life, and, and the dude just balls out. So you can only imagine what this guy can do with you know, catching his breath and having a season on the spelt in Pittsburgh. I didn't like the way the question was framed, but I liked the answer that Watt ended up giving. Uh, he was asked in so many words, you know, the effect that, that Minka had on her defense last season – uh, uh, and, and him being able to line up er everywhere, uh, in so many words, <laughs> Watt was asked if that allowed him to open up his motor more, uh, more than normal and take more chances than he normally would. Uh, Hey, I think that's a silly way to phrase the question there, but, mm -hmm. uh, Watt goes on to say, I don't know, man, my motor is always open and always running. Uh, he could have ended it there and, and sufficed the question if you get what I'm saying, but thankfully he went on, I guess he got the preface of what was trying to be asked there. He says, I definitely think that the stuff like that makes the quarterback hold on to the football just a quarter second longer. And as a pass rusher, that's all you need is, is a guy roaming around in the middle, just trying to play with, uh, uh, play with the quarterback said you can see a lot of pre-snap reads with the quarterback trying to find where Minka is predict where Minka's going and if he's watching Minka for just a half a second more instead of watching his receiver to try to get the ball out or look at his check down that's going to be a great recipe for success for the whole front front guys rushing passer so I thought that was a uh, uh, a brilliant well-crafted answer on Watt's part for a very crappy what i'd consider question and hopefully and I, and I believe it will happen it'll be harder for the quarterback to find minka in 2020 because it got pretty easy last year with him just you know in the post and, and it was easy to, to throw away from him and the dude side like two targets over the last eight weeks just offenses of course avoided him because that's a smart thing to do so hopefully quarterbacks will have to work a little harder to find out where he is and where he's going uh pre-snap this year i think you wrote about this a little bit at some point late last season or into or, or into the early off season here with that defense and uh and and I think the one thing that stuck out for me early on that I mentioned through throughout podcasts was the fact that 
this defense, uh, that defensive front able to get pressure and sacks with four and three man rushes was just incredible. And, 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 and the way they kind of schemed it up at times, especially in like third down situations there where you knew the quarterback was going to be dropping back and probably having to hold the ball a little bit due to down and distance, uh, situational situations, uh, there, uh, did, uh, I, I think they did a great job of, of at times getting either uh, TJ Watt or Bud Dupree isolated on, in one-on-one situations mm-hmm. and pu- putting it out there to let your best guy or guys win one-on-one situations there. And obviously TJ Watt was able to do that quite a bit. And then just to kind of, you know, you know a lot of times they, they would just sugar stuff and then, you know, how many times, uh, especially against, uh, let, let's say the game against the Cardinals, uh, j- you know, dropping eight, <laughs> you know, showing looks and, and especially in red zone and, and being able to drop eight in coverage and still be, being able to get it done with, with three men like rushes there. So uh, you get guys like Minka and Bush even more more you know acclimated more up to speed on that defense, more experienced in that defense uh, with the amount of guys coming back. You know, just like you know, like I've I've been hollering all off season. Just another reason. I mean, I you want to know, you want a reason not to have this 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 season canceled or cut down. It's being able to watch the Steeler defense <laughs> perform in 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 2020, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that Cardinals game you referenced, I know that was the one where Watt had that red zone, end zone interception, but what I liked about just the approach from the defense last year was they let their pass rushers rush. You know, I, I mentioned the stat before, but Watt, his rookie year, dropping the coverage 36.3% of the time, over a third of the time. Last year was under 10%, and Dupree was under 10% as well. So they let their pass rushers rush, get after the quarterback. Of course, just seeing those guys get older, more experienced, better technicians, you know, Watt and Dupree, that, that's one reason why they improved and their stats, their sack numbers shot up. But another reason is just they had more opportunities to get after the quarterback. They weren't going backwards as often. And, and so um, that, I think, was the right approach to just let Watt and Dupree go for and get, get after the quarterback. Right. If you in, in today's NFL, you've got to have, you know, it used to be, oh, oh just to let you know, make sure you have a better left tackle, right? Well, in today's NFL, and really it's been that yeah. way for a while now, you better have two good tackles. You mm-hmm, know, because your right tackle is facing TJ Watt now. Right, uh, because uh, of, of the way pass rushers ha- have developed over the years. Now, a lot of good, a lot of teams that that are able to compete, you know, week in and week out out in the NFL are able to do so because of their defense and and the ability to get pressure. So. Uh, yeah, uh, and it's up to uh, up to good defensive coordinators now to put to to get defense to get their best pass rushers in as many situations throughout a game where they could get that player one on one, you know. And we mm-hmm. saw that happen last year with Watt. And he won a lot of a lot of ways that way. And there were situations last year where I thought, you know, look, we, we saw a lot of good things out of Bud Dupree that we did not see in those first several years with him. And one of those I thought last year was his ability on the design situations that that you you want to get him one on one with the right tackle and him actually win that battle. Yeah, I thought for Dupree, and I'll, I'll segue this in the walk because Watt was asked about, you know, what do you think uh, was the catalyst for Dupree having the breakout year that he did? And here's Watt's answer. He says, quote, cool. Bud works his tail off. I think Bud is one of the hardest workers that I've ever been around. I think he's bought in and watched a lot of film. We've talked everything from snap count to foot placement, hand placement. We're just chilling together on and off the field. I think he's been able to explode on the scene. And so it really just isn't a magical answer. I mean, I think Dupree's always worked hard. There's been no doubt about that. To me, he just was healthy and was able to play with more power because of it. And I think that was kind of the the tool that he needed to unlock to become a, a really successful pass rusher. He seemed like his plan, his pass rushing plan came to be, came together better too. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought. Yeah, I think I when know. I think when you're healthy and you can have all your moves available, I think that's kind of unlocks it for you. And you know, I you know, I I, I still see things kind of pop up about him on Twitter and and how he just be, you know uh, uh, th- that he lucked in that 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 is overall pressure you know that is overall pressure versus you know, uh, or his pressure percentages still aren't where they should be. Yeah, that might be true, true to, to uh, you know, overall percentage wise there. But uh, on the flip side, it goes back to kind of what I stated there. There are, they're obviously going to want to try to try to scheme where they get probably TJ Watt in more of those one-on-one situations than, than Bud Dupree, you know? 
And a lot of that's going to, you know, in doing so is going to uh, uh, end up in in offensive lines sliding protection to the to the heavier side, which a lot of times in those situations is going to be Bud Dupree side, you know. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, I think you got to look at it in its totality. Uh, is Bud Dupree T.J. Watt? No. Uh, mm-hmm. but boy, there was sure, you know, it's gotten to the point now where, <laughs> I mean, look, I, I know it's easy to be excited about Alex Highsmith at this stage, you know, ba- based on, you know, coming out of college and all like that, but he's not where Bud Dupree's at right yet, you know, and, and, and nowhere close. And the other thing about Bud Dupree that really doesn't get a lot of play and really it goes back to, to, to what uh, was the case with James Harrison for most of his career was what? His run defense. His run defense. It's excellent. I, I have said it before. I said it multiple times last year. He's good as, as good as, as Dupree was as a pass rusher last year. And he's very good. His run defense was even better. Like his run defense in terms of an edge rusher might be a top five in football, maybe even top three. And I mean that in all sincerity. Like it's it is excellent. It's always been really good. It just was highlighted because I think it was better last year. And then when he became the complete player with the pass rusher ability, uh, you kind of appreciated the run defense all the more. You know, if uh, assuming they don't get a deal worked out with him in what's less than a week now, <laughs> and we're coming into the final, coming down the home stretch with this thing, uh, uh, with with Bud Dupree in the deadline to get him extended, obviously uh, uh, off of the franchise tag. You know, obviously not looking good. Uh, 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 prospects of that happening. We'll see what happens by what is it Tuesday at uh, at four p.m. But uh, within that. Uh, fans of this team have, have every reason to go out and get get jerseys. Well, maybe not that far, but uh, uh, be huge Bud Dupree fans uh, uh, this season, uh, even if he doesn't sign a long term deal. Because obviously, a, a a excellent good an excellent another season like he had last season, if not better, will will mean a lot of good things for this defense. It'll mean good things for Bud Dupree, get him paid, and who knows, maybe even uh, equate into a third-round compensatory draft pick uh, for mm-hmm. the Steelers on top of it. So I don't know what, you know, I I, I know uh, there's been a mixed bag when it comes to Bud Dupree since since the day he was drafted. Uh, but uh, if there was ever re- a reason to become a huge Bud Dupree fan, <laughs> it's, these, it's this next season here. <laughs> Agreed. Although I would not buy the jersey because if it does not happen, he's probably playing somewhere else this time next year. Right. That might be a little bit too far there, but uh, everything short. Keep your receipt if you buy the jersey. Everything short. Maybe buy one of those jersey t shirts, you know, that looks like a jersey, but just cost uh, a fraction less. There you go. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I agree with everything that you said about Dupree and everything that Watt said about Dupree. So kudos to his success. Anything? I think that was everything from Watt basically that was worth mentioning, worth writing about. Yeah, I like I like hearing from him. Uh, he definitely has. Uh, he, he, he in such a short time, he's got that. Uh, he's got that captain. Uh, that captain air about him. You know, mm-hmm. uh, now obviously we, we think uh, that that role is going to go to Cam Cam Hayward, not only this uh, coming season, but hopefully a few seasons beyond that. But uh, uh, he's he's right there next in line already. I think so. I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, not to jump too much into the whole sports landscape discussion, because I know so many people are probably tired of hearing about it. But it is worth mentioning that college football is kind of almost at the tipping point right now where their future is up in the air. We've seen the Ivy League say that they're canceling basically all, I think, fall sports and may not even move some stuff till the spring. The Big Ten said they're only going to play their conference games. They will not play the non-conference games this season. And there's going to be just increasing pressure on the rest of the college football world, especially the Big power five conferences to make so much money do do they play do they cancel do they try to move stuff to the spring and so it'd be very interesting to see what happens to college football because their status is very much up in the air right now they're already messing with our pre-draft from next year aren't they uh 2020 man yeah, yeah. I it's, mean, it's gonna be rough you 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 get you get through one obstacle or you get through one of these you know uh uh news cycles about something that that depresses you a little bit and 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 on to something else now and you know uh hey you know i i guess beggars can't be choosy at this point hopefully we get safe uh safe healthy football in some capacity this fall especially at the college level and you know so if it's only conference play then then so be it and that's the tape that we'll focus on. 
Yeah, all we can do. And it's obviously tougher for college football than the NFL because some schools are going to make less money. There's more, a lot more players, a lot more testing, other sports to, to, to worry about and, and try to figure out what, what they have to do. So just because college football were to cancel or have some sort of major alteration in the schedule does not have to mean the NFL will do the same. It's a little different set of circumstances, but um, it certainly would not be a good uh, sign if college football really starts to to – pack up for the season although we don't know what's going to happen right now and obviously it's going to, it's going to take a lot for the sec to, to to cancel things but that is certainly a possibility isn't the sec supposed to meet like today or something in, are they uh I, I thought i saw something that they've got a meeting coming up I, um, I, I thought it said today i might be wrong uh to to maybe decide what they're going to do. i at this point i mean i don't see look i mean even even if you're in the sec you know, some of your schedules probably going to be at, I mean, or some of your schedules obviously out of out of the SEC, right? You know, uh-huh. uh, so some of those games are going to get canceled probably just because some of these other conferences are canceling canceling their stuff. So, but right. by, by the time the smoke clears here, within probably about a week a, a week from now, I, I, most of these colleges are, or at least the Power Five conferences are going to probably be down to uh, just conference play, I would think. That sounds about right. And yeah, you got to worry about, you know, some schools that will not return in person in the fall. I think USC said they basically have plans to do it online. Then what happens to the the status of the sports teams? Do they still play sports even if they're, you know, an online school uh, for the time being? Who knows? A lot of questions that uh, we don't have answers to. Most people do not have answers to right now. But we'll keep monitoring the situation. And yeah, we'll use college football. And, and baseball is obviously going to start up before uh, NFL even reports a training camp. And you got NHL and NBA. And there'll be uh, a brief guide to kind of see if sports can work uh, in this current climate yeah that's one of the things that we've kind of talked about throughout this thing is at least at least you, know, you get to look at nba nhl and and uh major league baseball and see how see the, see what they go through here you know within the next 60 days yeah um all right dave we'll switch transition away from from all that stuff i want to talk about a series that i just wrapped up on steelers depot our article went up yesterday my Final thoughts on why the Steelers were so bad on opening drives, and there wasn't a whole lot of, of, of major conclusions overall. I think when you just have a bad offense in general, I mean, you of course would expect your opening drives to be bad, although it was worse than uh, even in relation to the rest uh, of, the, of the drives. Um, one thing that was interesting, though, was the run game on opening drives. You know, we talked a lot about you know the the perils of running out of heavy personnel when you pack things in with fullbacks and multiple tight ends and, and and the like and how that kind of invites the defense to load the box and the Steelers had 15 runs at a heavy personnel so 12 13 21 personnel groupings on those 15 carries they had 18 yards 1.2 yards per carry and on 11 in 11 personnel you know their base offense three receivers on the field they had 16 carries they averaged 3.7 yards per carry and I had a, a higher run success rate as well and so I think that's an indictment of coaching of poor self-scouting to basically be even and the amount of times they ran heavy the amount of times they ran 11 personnel and yet they were much better at 11 personnel and basically had no success doing it at heavy groups and this is just opening drives yeah just uh, opening drives. opening offensive series period yeah, for first possession of the game right, these are the stats right. from that uh and look, I you know you know I'm not surprised by that, uh, but by mm-hmm. the by those run numbers there, uh, I I'm not so much concerned about you know the balance or whatnot as I am just the overall you know because even the three point what was the what was the uh, 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 yards per carry uh, out out of eleven. 3.7, which is not great, <laughs> which but a whole not, lot better. Yeah, what? but what was the success rate there, you know? Yeah, 31%. Uh, 31% success rate? Mm-hmm. Oh, I mean, I, 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 to me, 3.7 and 1.7 might as well be the same number. Well, you know, I, I, I get uh, it. I, I get the success rate stuff, but so when it's like when it's that stark of a difference, I mean, why? There's no benefit to running at a heavy. Clearly, no number indicates that this is a good idea. How many of those uh, were were uh, uh, out of heavy included eligible guys? Including like Zach Banner. Yeah, I mean, whatever. I think all in thirteen personnel. I don't know how many of those were. were um, of, I don't know how many thirteen personnel there were, but probably five or six. And I imagine. Some of those included some Xavier Grimble in there at the start of the season, it seems like. Um, probably two or three. Maybe I'd have to go back and look at Matthew starting, but not a whole lot. Yeah. Uh, how much motion was did you detect in, in any of that? 
on those particular runs or just uh, overall? Just overall, uh, overall drives? opening drives. Uh, it was hit or miss. They did some stuff, I think, early, and I think later towards the year they did, they did bring in some motion, which was helpful, and we talked about that. And I want to get – I want to try to find the number on how much pre-snap motion this team did use because those numbers kind of float out there, but they're kind of hard to find. I don't know if you're able to come up with that number. I, I know they were in. A, I, ESPN just had a uh, a very nice article on it uh, just this week that should be easy to find. Just Google ESPN uh, 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 motion NFL or something like that. You should be able to find it. Uh, they had the uh, the top. Uh, the top third percent, you know, the top or the top third in the league in pre-snap motion, and the bottom third of the league, uh, but they didn't give you the middle. Well, the Steelers right. were in the middle, uh, right. somewhere in there. Uh, uh, and 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 no, I don't have to come. And here's the thing that I thought they did a good job of clarifying. And we'll we'll obviously get these numbers. We'll track them down, but maybe by next next podcast here. Uh, but uh, uh, they they consider in snap pre snap motion really they 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 clarified it as two ways you know a guy going in motion and then uh, facing you know, not considered really being movement motion even if he might be moving if he's facing the line of scrimmage versus being in motion and not not parallel to the line of scrimmage. In other words, still okay. on, still on the move. Okay. Mm-hmm. So those are, those are two things that I think uh, need, need clarification in, in our stuff going forward. And those are, I think one of those things that we're going to track more, we'll, 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 uh, we'll chart uh, at another level this year going forward uh, in that, because look, we've talked about, uh, 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 and you wrote about this right out of shoot when, when Matt Canada was brought on, you know, uh, things that we we expect to see more of now in this offense and pre snap motion is one of those, but not just pre snap motion where you got a a H back shuffling, <laughs> you know, facing parallel to the line or a uh, uh, a half a half a half motion by Juju out of the slot just to try to pick up a key on whether you know whether you're a man or, uh, you know, what kind of coverage you get. We're talking about mm-hmm. full-fledged uh, uh, motion because a lot of times what that – and I thought the ESPN article did a good job of kind of getting into this. That those kind of pre-snap motions make makes it tough on corners and safeties to have to read on the fly, especially when it kind of has to come to kind of run responsibilities. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, trying to adjust your run fit. The whole defense has to now adjust on that motion instantaneously. Um, there's no you know, chance to be able to communicate anything. I think the Ravens were tops and in, increased that motion. And, and it, was, it, wasn't, and it wasn't close either from right. from what I remember. They they were way out in front uh, of the league in, as far as that goes. And no surprise, they had the best you know run game because of it um because they were so so apt to to, to motion guys and, and the stress you know defenses horizontally and screw run fits and, and all that so yeah i mean i think i'd like to see more i mean i know the Steelers were not the worst in football at it but they certainly could have been a whole lot better and probably needed to be near the tops in football to help out those young quarterbacks and try to create any advantage possible for their offense i i agree and and kind of going back to to some film study on mcfarland especially uh Two years, his freshman season when Canada was there, I think I highlighted a time or two, maybe on Twitter uh, or somewhere in in a post somewhere of how they used uh, McFarland in motion, you know, uh, and sometimes even in 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 in, in two back settings here. Uh, now, well, with, uh, that's like the white the white tiger. It seems like you know every off season we talk about oh, is this the year that the Steelers use you know a little bit more pony backfield, <laughs> you know, and and everybody gets we reach peak off season days, uh, right? Uh, and everybody gets hyped about it, and I, and I warn how you might see zero or one snaps of it once the season uh, begins. I'm starting to get maybe a little bit of a feeling here, Alex, that we might see more than one this year. So, uh, mm. so take okay. that and, 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 and put it in your equation there. But, uh, <laughs> no, in, in all seriousness, you know, I, I think that's some of the stuff that, that can help the running game. And that's the kind of stuff I think we need to be looking for early in the season here is not just any kind of pre-snap motion, but pre-snap motion, especially in a running game and pre-snap motion that at the ball, at, when the ball snapped, that player's still in motion. 
I agree, hundred percent. And then looking at the pass game, what's interesting for Feetner because obviously, you know, any offensive coordinator in Pittsburgh gets that uh, run, run, pass label. He was actually more aggressive uh, on opening drives than than what you might expect, especially given the quarterback situation. On seven of the nine opening drives, they threw the ball on first down. They ran the ball on nine of them, which is a probably better split than than you would think. And I think in week fourteen, it was split evenly at seven seven. They ran the ball the last two weeks to tip the scale uh, in in the run game favor. When it comes to the pass game, uh, one of their staple concepts was their Hank uh, concept, which is just you know basically uh, mirrored curl flat combination to the outside with a Hank route over the middle, which is a five yard generally over the ball curl route by the tight end. They ran that on 19 percent of their passing plays on opening drives, so very very Hank happy as the way I framed it on Steelers Depot, and it's a good concept. And some of these quarterbacks, you know, Duck and Mason struggle with that, which is a very basic concept. So uh, that is very core to what even Haley did, what Feetner's done. And um, that is just kind of one of the staple concepts we'll see a lot on opening drives. Uh, here's a percentage of offensive plays, not including spikes and kneels. Uh, top 10 uh, rates of motion at the snap per Seth Wel- uh Is it Welder or Wilder? Seth uh, Walder uh, on ESPN.com. Uh, Ravens led the league 34% uh, of, of uh, rates of motion at the snap. 34%. That's a lot, man. Uh, second place was the Chargers. They're at 20%. So, like I said, it wasn't close. A 14% gap there. That's wow. uh, that's, uh, that's 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 pretty huge. Now, they, uh, they cut off at the top 10 as the top 10, obviously, and, and that's the Bengals at 11%. The, uh, the, the bottom 10 uh, goes from 4% all the way up to 7%, and, uh, and that's the Colts leading the bottom top 10. So the Steelers were somewhere probably between 8. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some deductive math here <laughs> reasoning Sherlock for you. Holmes. Okay. Uh, look, this is why I do podcast and run, you know, uh, you know, such an amazing site like Steelers Depot because of my, my ability to figure these things out. Uh, 8 to 10%, somewhere in there. You should be the uh, new host of the Unsolved Mysteries. It's coming out, Dave. <laughs> I think you do a good job. They don't even have a host this year. Uh, uh, anyway, yeah, so yeah, you, you can safely assume somewhere in the 8 to 10% range, and that's probably not good enough, again, especially given the issues this offense had last year. You need to try to do anything creatively to – you know, give yourself an advantage, give yourself an edge pre-snap, give the quarterback some clue, give the run game some help, and that did not happen nearly enough last season. We would definitely, based on what we know or think we know now about Matt Canada, uh, a year from now, we would think that the Steelers will be in the top 10, would we not? Well, I mean, we, that's exactly how much influence is Canada going to have. You know, still remains to be seen. Hopefully a greater influence. Hopefully he'll be able to bring some ideas and they'll be accepted and incorporated in the offense. But I'm kind of in a wait and see approach there. All right. All right. So that is the open drive study. Dave, I think all we have left is uh, finishing up our training camp preview of the offense, and that is going to be the wide receivers. We spent a lot of time talking about the receivers over the last couple of podcasts, but just kind of the, to reframe the, the the big three starters, you know, Juju, Deontay Johnson, James Washington. Um, what are your overall expectations for that group this this year? They're high, and especially with uh, a healthy Ben Roethlisberger back, I don't know why. I don't. I don't understand why they would be high. Uh, now, is th- is this uh, uh, is that trio of three the best trio in the NFL? Probably not. Uh, I don't think. I, I think if you probably polled, you know, uh, fifteen or twenty of these major media hacks, uh, uh, you know, I don't think uh, I, you'd probably be hard pressed to get any of them or to rank them tops overall. But, however, comma, I think you might get a few of them to put them in the top five, and I would think that's fair where where the expectations should be. The problem is they they obviously all haven't put it together at, at, at one time here, and that's the kind of thing that you would be expecting to happen. And look, they've got the experience, they've got youth and experience on their side. Uh, two things that that uh, uh, I think are key. You know, uh, when it comes to that position group is, is youth and experience there. So uh, they, they definitely have the uh, a, a good enough uh, level of athleticism. Uh, you know, they seem to, on the surface to have a, a pretty good coach coming in and taking over that unit as well, too. So, uh, 
you know, I, you're asking me what expectations are, I, I, I guess, or what I think about the group. I think mm-hmm. I think they have the potential to be a top five trio uh, in the NFL this season. I agree. That's, I think that's it's re- a starting point. Mm-hmm. I think it's reasonable to assume that all three are going to play. Well, of course, the return of Ben is, is the biggest thing for those guys. I just like that there are three very distinct and different skill sets when you're talking Deontay as your ex, your AB type, someone that can really beat man coverage, win one-on-one, you know, catch short, run long. It's kind of his approach. Shuju is that, you know, difficult, big slot receiver that's tough from nickel corner, someone that can break a lot of tackles, uh, may not be the most elusive guy, but has better speed than you think and is tough and can make those catches over the middle. Then James Washington as your vertical threat, your Z receiver, someone that can uh, win and, and hopefully continue to stack corners and be that vertical threat for this offense and just give that component that, that needs to, to happen and exist for this offense to thrive uh, at, at its max potential and ability. So I like to use three different types of receivers and they all kind of bring something different to the table that, that's really valuable. You really do have distinct kind of guys there. And I think one of the things that I would like to see is those guys get moved around a little bit more. Uh, and you should probably see that a little bit more this year with those three, you know, obviously not interchanging a lot, but, uh, uh, some, you know, is there, is there one guy where you feel like I want to see him in this spot more than he's, than he's been, um, maybe, maybe Juju, uh, more, you know, on on the outside, okay. On occasions to see if he can win on the outside. Mm-hmm. I'd like to see Deontay in the slot a little bit. I know that's kind of foreign to him, but I think obviously he's got a skill set to create space over the middle. And he, uh, he can win. He can definitely win against. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I have no doubt that that if faced up against like a shiftier nickel, you know, uh, mm-hmm. uh, guys that are generally have have good, you know, very good uh, footwork. Uh, uh, you know, and, and be able to, to, to be a little bit more stickier, maybe in situations in the slot. I definitely think Deontay has the ability to get off to, to win in those situations. So yeah, uh, 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 him in the slot. And like I said, Juju, you know, just a little bit more, uh, on the outside. Yeah, I think Deontay's releases are good. His, his ability to create you space. Know, J- no, J- James Washington is obviously not a guy that you're going to want to work a lot in the slot, you know. Right. Uh, you, you'll probably work him in in a bunch type situation, you know, mm-hmm. uh, sure. obviously, and and you know you could probably get away with uh, with 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 a snap or two with 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 uh, Washington maybe at the X, but mm-hmm. I, I just would like to see more of these guys be a little bit more interchangeable, not a lot, but just a little more. Right, and I agree, and then that's reasonable to expect because you love James Washington now in his third year and Deontay in his second year, and these, none of this is new to those guys, and, and that should help. And yeah, just the principle of the matter of maybe you need to just move someone around to shake a coverage, give a different look, you want to run a different concept, or just, you know, maybe there's a corner that's traveling but doesn't travel to the slot, for example, so you get Deontay on a different matchup, you know, in a particular game, maybe against the Ravens or somebody. So I think just in the principle of it, there, there's a lot of benefit to moving those guys around. And another year older with all these guys, and obviously NFL experience. I think one of the things where each one of them can mature this off season on into the season is their each of their abilities to make a lot of lot of routes look a lot similar to each other. In what sense? In, in, in sense, and and you know, not not give it away. You know, uh, you take a guy like uh, uh, Monty Cooper has a great ability to make a lot of routes look the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah, AB was king of that. I started AB was, against was the Colts, right? Very, very good yeah. about that. Uh, just, just small uh, definitions of route running ability and, and and improving in those areas. You know, uh, uh, bending those routes. You know, uh, working on bending the routes just at a little bit better angle to 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 allow for. Uh, you know, to, to bend out to get a little bit of extra extra separation there. You know, just refined areas of, of, of route running there. Uh, you know, one of the things I think sometimes with, with, with Juju still, uh, has, you know, we'll, we'll round those routes off a little bit at the top. You know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Deontay uh, kind of the same way, which – but but I, I think you really saw a little bit you know when he when it looked like he was healthy last year at his healthiest, which really to me I I thought those final four games man for a guy that hit that supposedly hit that wall, you know he really looked maybe at his healthiest I thought uh, uh, in in kind of those four four games boy I just broke down that Jets game yesterday, his ability to uh, 
to to sit, uh, especially on some of those uh, on some of those curls uh, there, and and sell that route early and get up on top of the on, on defenders' feet and get them to open their hips and then break back and get the separation uh, that he got in just twelve yard areas. You know, uh, uh, which is virtually vertical routes in those situations there, uh, except for the comeback or the curl part. I thought he did a tremendous job. Now, there were some instances, though, where I thought maybe he kind of, you know, in bowls that didn't go his way, kind of rounding those things off. You got to sell those things all the time because in, in the NFL, a lot of times if the, if the ball doesn't come your way on one play, you can set something up for that, you know, for, for mm-hmm. the next time when it does. So just little intricacies, I think, like that. Yeah, no, I think I think all those attention to detail things is really what separates the good from the great receivers. And and to your point, you made a moment ago. I mean, it, it is a young group. I mean, is anyone older than twenty five? I mean, what Washington is how old? Twenty four. Juju's twenty three still, I think. Um, it, it it is a very mature group. They've had to really grow up fast because of life experience. Obviously, the passing of Daryl Drake and the fact they've had to play a lot. I mean, even James Washington's rookie year was playing a lot, especially that first half of the season, and it kind of didn't work, and he didn't really play a lot the, the, the back half of the year. But this is a group, as you said, is that combination of of youth, but also with a lot of experience. Right, and you know, you would expect you know a guy like Deontay to get him, but you were you know one of the things I think that sticks out to me still, and and, and I'll, I hope to get through the final game of of his contextualization uh, today or by by Saturday at the latest here, uh, is the fact that. Uh, there were several things that, that stuck stuck out going target by target with him. A, and I, I just hit on one of those things uh, with him, was the ability on those on, on kind of those curls and those comebacks uh, to get, uh, and against a man type situations too, is to, the ability to get separation that he did, I thought was phenomenal uh, there. Uh, the other thing that kind of stuck out and I have mentioned this in the pack in in the past too recently was, yeah, there were the situations where, uh, he was able to win downfield more than, uh, uh, more than 15 yards down the field. Okay. Which, which is fine. Uh, but there still probably, I think the percentage of that probably wasn't yet you know what? Anywhere close, obviously, to what we saw A B be able to do out of the X. I think by going back and 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 going through this contextualization on 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 Deontay Johnson's routes from the full season was, man, he had a lot of short targets, man. I mean, mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of those kind of underneath kind of short targets there. Now, uh, the good thing about it is is. Uh, and, and he was one of the league leaders in in enforcing missed tackles, right? Something like mm-hmm. eight, eighteen of those. So uh, that that's definitely okay to have a lot of those targets if you're not only catching them but winning, winning and getting that yak afterwards. So there, there's nothing wrong with that. It was just it, it it just felt as as I was going through it more and more. I, I came away feeling like, man, he had a lot of a lot of less than five yard targets. You know, so obviously mm-hmm. I, I think one of the things we want to see with him expanding on that in, in, in his second season. And look, all of that's not his fault, obviously, because, I mean, the, the Steelers offense really uh, didn't take a lot of deep shots. Right. You right. Know? They didn't throw a lot. They didn't take a lot of deep shots when they did. Right. And and, and really didn't throw a lot past 10 yards. You know, you talk about mm-hmm. not throwing deep, not throwing, you know, because the, 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 the quote unquote designation of a deep pass in the NFL is more than than uh is more than 15 yards. Well, I mean, if you look at it just in 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 more than 10 yards, <laughs> you know, uh there wasn't a lot of that. Now, now would Ben Roethlisberger back you would think that that you know that that number is going to increase uh obviously uh uh with him back with all these, you know, wide receivers overall there. So I think that's just one of the things that I stuck out that, that stuck out to me that obviously wasn't, wasn't on him. Uh, but, uh, you know, it was something to look for just him getting more targets more than let's say five yards past the line of scrimmage. Yeah, I think that's a good point um, to to be able to to do it all because that X receiver has to do it all. That's kind of your job is you got to be able to run any route, be able to win. You know, you're going to be facing a lot of one on one coverage against the corners. You're going to get a lot of looks, and sometimes you know if they have if they're playing inside leverage on you and you're you're three by one backside. I mean, you can't run the in breaking route. You got to basically run either the, the go or the um or or the comeback on the outside. So you know, there's going to be times where you're going to be forced to to outside release and to run vertical, and you better make plays downfield as well. 
I like seeing Deontay Johnson in those nasty kind of splits too, you know, mm-hmm. because yeah. that, 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 you know, uh, especially with his ability to get off and, 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 uh, his, inabil- his ability to get out of breaks and all. And look, we saw, you know, it might not seem like much. And I think it was against a young, younger corner on that touchdown of his that he had against the Jets, right? There's just, a, you know, it's not, it, it wasn't a huge kind of nod to the middle there, but it was just enough. And I think some other things during the game kind of helped set, set that up for him anyway. But he just, you know, he blew right past that 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 younger cornerback in that game for that touchdown in that situation and once again it wasn't a it it wasn't oh man did you see that kind of nod there but it was just enough there that that allowed him to uh to plant and go and and and, and you'll not just get not just stack that corner uh out of kind of a a a a, a, a more tighter split if you will but uh it I mean it wasn't even close you know Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in those situations there. So just little things uh, like that. Now, when it comes to James Washington, and I wrote about this earlier in the week, probably a good time to kind of quickly segue into, into that, talking about wide receivers there, is he had the most deep pass <laughs> incompletions, uh, or uh, he was second most, tied for second most in deep pass incompletions that were the fault of the quarterback last season. So uh, there was that. So, I, what was the total of those 12, I think? And I think in total, I thought he was targeted, I think, what, was, what did I have there, 30, 30 times in, in total? I had to pull up uh, what the exact number were was for him getting targeted deep versus how many he ash, actually caught here. Hold on just a minute. Let me pull this yeah. up. Obviously, though, it's not surprising to see him rank no. so high given the – inefficiency of the offense and that you know i mean the deep balls of johnny holton last year which were not as holton's fault sometimes not but yeah it's not surprising to see washington uh be ranked so high on that list well i tell you what johnny Holt, if johnny i i, I still contend that if johnny holton makes a couple of those uh deep deep ball uh catches especially in that game against the browns maybe that Maybe that makes a little bit of difference uh, uh, about uh, Mason Rudolph there. But, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I've already ran it on that enough. And there, there are a couple balls that I think uh, 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 Johnny Holton, and that's why probably Johnny, Johnny Holton's an ex-member of the Pittsburgh Steelers right right now. It's him not coming down with, with a couple of those balls that he probably should have there. Uh, Washington was targeted 32 times in total on deep passes of more than 16 yards in 2019. He caught just 12 uh, of those targets for 430 431 yards and two touchdowns so 37.5 percent catch rate uh overall on deep passes uh not great now look i mean it, it, the closer you get to 50 percent the better when it comes to these deep deep passes more than 15 yards down you know, past the line of scrimmage there obviously 30 37.5 percent is on the bottom end. And by the way, both of those deep touchdown pass receptions came from Devlin, Devlin uh, Hodges or both those deep, yeah, deep pass touchdown receptions came from, from Devlin Hodges. I bet you can, I, I bet you, I bet by saying that you can identify both those plays. Uh, the one was against the Bengals when he came in to replace uh, Mason, right? Ding, 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 yard touchdown. Ding, ding, the other ding. one was the Browns game, the touchdown, that kind of adjustment he made in the end zone. Ding, 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 <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> what, what do I win? You win a year's supply of turtle wax uh, for, oh, that, for wow. that new car of yours, Alex. What uh, I always wanted. Yeah, there you go. Uh, and Rice Cerrone, the San Francisco tree, mm. a year's supply of that as well, too. Uh, Can I return those gifts in no, exchange no, or something? No, no and you'll, this is the worst you're, prices, right? Yeah, you have to pay taxes on them as well, too. Mm. Showcase uh, showdown's really gotten out of ideas. I. Uh, we, I'd like to get in a situation where we're not able to remember them as easily, <laughs> and quite on, and, and, and quite honestly, the I Devlin kind of got away with one on that one against the Browns, right? Yeah, that was a great catch. That was probably one of Washington's best plays last year. It that was really a was. Uh, now there were other ones that that weren't touchdowns that Devlin completed to Washington that were just beautiful bucket throws. That's, that's what I want to see more of from, from whoever, you know, obviously hope Roethlisberger's back there uh, under center all, all season doing that. But that, that's kind of thing. I I think the big, and, and, and I'm going this route just to kind of wrap it all up here. 
uh, next year at this time, I don't want to have to write a post about James Washington being <laughs> second overall in deep pass incompletions that were the quarterback's fault. Mm-hmm. Uh, I Absolutely. think that's a good problem to have. Uh, this is a big, I think you will agree, this is a big season uh, for for James Washington. Uh, I think, you know, I, I, it goes without saying that both of us expect him to, to, to be the primary Z to start this thing off. Uh, the return of Ben Roethlisberger should help things. Right out of the chute, we should see the uh, the deep pass completion percentage be higher, you know, through the first quarter of the season than 37.5%, right? I sure hope so. It'd be nice um, because even in 2018, there were issues at first start of the year with the whole Wi-Fi thing and the deep ball not working. And But t- speaking of players who need big years, I mean, just to touch on Juju briefly, it's obviously a huge year for him contractually. And I think we said it before, so I won't harp on it too much again, but yeah, I think he'll have a bounce back year with his health, Ben's health. Um, I think we'll see something much more similar to 2018 than 2019. So obviously it's a really critical year for Juju and, and what his future will mean in Pittsburgh. And I think specifically with Washington, we have to be talking about, uh, you know, nice percentage of home run catches for him. Mm-hmm. Not, not yeah. necessarily t- touchdowns, but uh, 20 yard gainers, things that things that he things that put him on the map at Oklahoma State. You know, mm-hmm. but there was serious improvement with him last year. I think it gets lost in the context of the offense being terrible. I did a video to break down on that a couple weeks ago. There was major improvement, and I think he can continue to be that vertical threat for this offense. And he'll need to because, like I said, it's a. I mean, you got a guy like Chase Claypool that you're expecting to help out. You know, probably later rather than sooner. But if if James, if a guy like James Washington doesn't get off to a great start with Roethlisberger in the deep pass category that might give birth to more Claypool snaps, you know, yeah, uh, sooner could. rather than later. Well, let's transition to Claypool and just, I mean, it's hard to even frame but, expectations. But, 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 before we do, where would you like to see Juju improve the most? I mean, it's really not about, it's just about staying healthy. I think if he just stays healthy and Ben's healthy, I mean, I think it's going to be solid. Obviously, you don't want to see him fumble in some of those critical situations, but there isn't, to me, a huge coaching point that that, that I feel like he's really lacking. I just I just want him to be healthy and available. Okay. All right. Is there anything that, that comes to mind for you in June? No, no, just uh, uh, just a, more, more, a, a, a better route runner. Okay, especially on the outside. He's improved on the outside a good bit, but he, he's, he's admitted he's more comfortable in the slot. Right. Yeah. Um, all right. So to go to Claypool again, just framing expectations for the season. I'm kind of with you. I think it's hard to really expect a lot the first half of the year after all so much time has been missed and will continue to be missed. And is this dude's first time in a stadium going to be week one against the Giants? I mean, that's that's very much possible right now. So it's really hard to expect a whole lot from him on offense immediately. But, you know, we know that he can make an impact on special teams. And of course, all it's going to take is one injury to, to elevate him into the lineup and, and see serious snaps the way that it happened to Deontay Johnson last year. Right, you would think best suited, uh, obviously uh, 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 Z, or maybe you could get him some big slot work, you know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, as the season progresses to maybe uh, save a little bit of wear and tear, tear, maybe in that second half of the season on a guy like Juju uh, there. Now, the things that we know or think that he can do coming out of college that we would expect to see uh, with him would be the contested catches, specifically on the sideline. Uh, near the sideline, uh, really just his college tape obviously is, is filled with that kind of stuff there. Uh, red zone, 50, 50 balls, wherever, uh, uh, is another thing. And kind of the questions that, that I, I come away from his college tape of wanting to see him do at the NFL level is, and, and I mentioned this is his ability to get on top of cornerbacks on the outside and just stack them for, for, you know, for easy wins, you know? Yeah, it'll be interesting, you know, I mean, because obviously the whole goal for these young receivers, the way it's worked in the past is you get taught one position first, and then you kind of get taught others as you become comfortable with the one. And Claypool moved around some in college, which helps. He's not James Washington coming out of Oklahoma State, but, you know, is he going to be just so behind because he's going to be just learning one position early? It's not going to allow him to move around. I don't know how they're going to play it, but but that transition just in general from college to the NFL from, from a receiver standpoint is, is difficult. Usually you don't see that success till the back half of the year in even a normal situation, and you're just not seeing – you're not going to get that opportunity right now. So so um, I think special teams for Claypool to start with maybe some specialty stuff and 
red zone packages and especially uh, groupings for him. But uh, it's hard to count on a, a major impact right away. His hit, and we mentioned this the other day, his path to, to playing more earlier in the season probably going to unfortunately would be related to to an injury, you know, mm-hmm. or poor performance by a guy like, let's say, James Washington. Yeah, and if there's an injury, I mean, he's going to be counted on for a lot. So he may have to pull the Deontay Johnson and grow up quickly because you can't assume these guys are going to go, the top three are going to be healthy the whole time. And Claypool is going to probably end up playing more than, than the team would like ideally because someone's going to get dinged at some point. Well, however, like like I said, however many snaps that that that, that he uh, he winds up getting, you know, the things that we sh- we should see right out of shoot with him is – contested catch down the field ability uh and you know uh stuff I mean, you you can move him around in the red zone i mean heck he had some i thought he had some nice little short area wins uh mm-hmm. in the red zone which really isn't kind of his his specialty but uh he can he can kind of uh give you know he we've seen him win in the you know as a big slot uh, uh, red zone, red zone receiver already, and, and more deeper red zone than just let's say 19 yard line red zone kind of stuff. But that that's the kind of stuff that you can do with him, and uh, he's the kind of guy that you put him in the slot and kind of run. Uh, uh, what's that? What's uh, what's that kind of what? What's that route combination deep uh, that 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 uh, Haley likes to Haley liked liked to run down deep. Uh. I'm not sure what oh, you're referring to. I'm I'm, I'm drawing a blank at the, the route combination. It's 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 like how is it a three man combination? Yeah, or yeah. Like uh, sale? Uh, no. Uh, I'm drawing a damn blank on, on their on. indie Z post play that they would run. Uh, snag some snag snag some, yeah okay. some some snag stuff down in there. You know, okay. uh, where where he would potentially be the guy going. Uh, uh, running that corner, you know, out of mm-hmm. it. Uh, those are those are type situations where I think you can use him and his size and his leaping ability and 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 get a win in those areas. Yeah, Keith Miller's first touchdown came on a snag concept. I was watching that last night against the Titans. So uh, that is a three man combination with a corner, a curl, and a flat um, triangle read there, uh, which stresses the defense horizontally and vertically. Um, yeah, I think I think the best thing you could do with Claypool early is just play to those innate physical tools. He's just overall size, speed, you know. Comp- Combination, which is going to lend itself to some jump ball moments where you don't really have to coach that up as much. It's just kind of a natural thing for him to go up and get the ball. And that's probably the best way to let him succeed early, just to kind of focus on those innate physical talents. He just wakes up with every day of his life. And one of the drawbacks with him that we saw on tape, or at least that, I, that, that, that stuck out to, uh, with him, uh, obviously his drop percentage was a little high, but a lot of those came on, those short underneath crossers, believe it or not. I mean, a lot of his drops, I bet, were within seven yards of the line of scrimmage. Did you, you know? see a, a theme? Was he just taking his eyes off? The uh, yeah, I, I think it was field? him. I think it was him just just trying to run with the football uh, too early. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I, that that's the only thing that that I think it could be. You know, uh, now now there were a couple of probably questionable. Uh, ball location ones, but still with it, with his catch radius, you know, th- those things need to be caught at the end, you know, at, at the college and NFL sure. level, uh, with him. But I think that's the thing that stuck out the most w- with him was, were the drops and within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage and generally with him working, uh, you know, either left to right, to right, to left. Important news on Claypool just coming in. He's a 70 overall in Madden 21. So for those dying for that information. There you go. Yeah, I don't know if that's uh, – I, I see it here in relation to a lot of wide receivers, but uh, uh, I don't know how accurate that might be. Yeah, I don't I don't have his whole profile pulled up, but uh, don't buy Ben until they fix franchise. That's all I'll say about that anyway. Um, I, what, let's do some over-unders for Claypool. Uh, over-under 200 snaps. He's going to play offensive snaps this year. I think over by the time the dust settles, you know, it goes back to Dave and Dave and his uh, illustrious. These things have a funny way of working themselves <laughs> out uh, right. response. But I, I think by us going through those snap totals the other day, uh, I think odds are good for him hitting the at least the twenty percent mark, which is right about that. So mm-hmm. uh, will it? Unfortunately, it might be because of a hamstring here or hamstring right. there because of another guy 
potentially. I hope that's not the case. But uh, uh, I'll put it to you this way. I think he's, I think it's an okay problem to have if he doesn't hit the 20% mark. Does that sure. make sense? Yeah, well, it means everyone stayed healthy, first right. of all, which is excellent news and in productive. itself. And everyone played well. Yeah, played well. Yeah, it'll, but it's interesting because, like, let's say that Deontay Johnson went down. Does that open the door for Claypool snaps? I mean, inherently you think it would, but Claypool's probably not going to play the X, or he might. I mean, I don't know. But then does somebody else get moved over? I just – I just wonder how the dominoes will fall if it still get, opens the door for Claypool. Well, he did play some X. Yeah, he did. You know? Uh, but where do they not, want to start not, him? If they start well, him with the Z? Yeah, here, here's the thing. Uh, it would be a lot of stuff on the fly with him if, if that happens, I would think. Because right. his, dangerous. His, his skill set is not ideal for that. Right. I mean, you could you know, move Juju to the X, I guess, and then play Claypool in the slot. I mean, you could move some guys around. I, I, I don't know. I just – Throw that out there. I just wonder if an injury in itself will will automatically mean more play time for Claypool if it's not a position he plays. Who's the second best X on the team right now, pure, uh, purely speaking? Yeah, I got to get back to you on that one. Yeah. I mean, they don't really have one. I mean, it's uh, Juju, I guess. Juju did it in that 2018 Week 17 you know, Bengals game with, with AB going haywire. So I guess it'd be Juju just because he's like second best receiver. Uh, experience. I mean, let, let's, let's, let's go non-starter here. Anthony I mean, Johnson? I've never even watched Anthony Johnson take a snap in the NFL, so I don't know. Switzer, I may, maybe. I mean, they really had it's Deontay Johnson or bust. It's kind of what we're clearly framing here. I don't think it's. I mean, uh, apologies to the uh, Deion Kane fan club out there, but I don't think it's him. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I know he like played. He, he played a lot. I mean, he played you know some of that. You know, Quadri Henderson. I mean, like who's even like the second best slot receiver on this team? I mean, they just. A lot of backups here. Like, yeah. Uh, I would think probably Claypool right now. Yeah, but he only played it, what, 20% of the time? I mean, right. obviously, he's got a different skill set and young guy. I mean, could you count on him right away? I mean, would it be Switzer? I, yeah, I mean, there's some questions there for sure. So, like I said, it's just interesting. Just a thought exercise. What do you remember about Anthony Johnson Tate from Buffalo? I mean, it was decent. I mean, I liked his tape coming out of Buffalo. I was kind of surprised he wasn't drafted, but you know, receiver classes are so deep every year. I mean, he's a big body type of dude. I'm not gonna pretend like I've watched him in a while. I've studied him super in depth when he was coming out of Buffalo, but he was an intriguing player that I'm, I'm glad is on the team. Is he a guy that we're not given enough? Uh, that we probably have not talked about enough yet. I mean, I guess we really haven't talked about him at all. So I guess by that standpoint, sure, I, I can accept that premise. But he's still a young guy trying to make this roster. Given the circumstances, uh, practice squad might be best bet for him. I think he could. I think he could maybe make a push for maybe a roster spot. I, I, you know, I once again, no. I'll, I thought Deion Kane did some nice things last year. I'm not convinced though. Uh, I put you this way. I think he can be pushed for a roster spot. Yeah, I don't think you're convinced by any of those those back of the you know roster receivers. I think Saeed Blocknell is my my sleeper right now when he comes to even beyond Deion Kane to the world. But uh, I mean, the opportunity for these guys to show what they can do is going to be very limited, and potentially we won't get to see really any of it, uh, unfortunately. Uh, would you like to? We don't need to talk about uh, Switzer, right? As far as this I, wide, I'm wide sure receiver group, right? people, people will not receiver. like us to talk about. Well, but the last thing on Claypool really quick to go back to him with the over under um, over under. What do you want to say to good over under 30 catches this year? Yeah, I'm going to take the uh, 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 what is uh, under Alex. What is under? All right. What, do, you, do you think that's a good over under to set? Should I set the bar lower? Is that too easy? To Man, it, it feels like that. If it, to, to me, it feels like that's a slam dunk under. Okay. All right. So would I give you a 20? Would you still take the over? The, I mean, because you're saying he's playing over 200 snaps. Not that I mean, he doesn't have to catch 30 passes off of that or 30 passes off of that. Oh, man. I but I assume you're not going to say he's catches. If you're saying he's playing 200 plus snaps, he's not catching five passes. I would hope he'd catch more than that. Right. More than that. But I, I would still struggle with taking the over 20, I think. Mm. So it's a lot of I know, I know, I, I know that's I know that's low, but, uh, you know. I get it. Yeah, no, I get it for sure. Um, well, I mean, I ob- obviously, an injury could change that in a hurry, but uh, sure. Uh, and I would think too. I would, I would think if he does get my 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 view on him playing snaps, uh, uh, hitting that twenty percent mark too would include him red zone, 
and and some Z stuff or some stuff where he can do what he does, which is make contested catches down the field. And just overall percentage wise, how many how many catches is he going to make more than fifteen yards down the field? Mm-hmm. You know, sure. Let's uh, let's frame it like this. I pulled up Plexico Burris's rookie stats from two thousand. Give me the over under if Claypool betters these numbers his his rookie year. Uh, Plexico had twenty two receptions his rookie season. Claypool going to be over or under that? Man, I still tr- start struggling to take the over there, so I would take the under. Okay, two hundred and seventy three yards is what Burris had his rookie year. Twelve point four yards per catch. Over or under two seventy three. Guessing going to go under. Yeah, I'd go under. Under, yeah. But if he's gonna be a vertical threat, let's say he catches you know sixteen yards per catch. He would, he would, he would need a, he would need a. I, I think it would require that sixty six yard touchdown. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> there you go. And then Burris did not catch a touchdown his rookie year. Well, Claypool catch a touchdown. Yeah, I, I like the odds of that a lot, you know, better because because I All think right. I think he has a. Uh, I think he'll have the opportunity to do that. All right, fair enough. Yeah, I think I think Burris's line uh, is kind of what I could expect with Claypool. If I gave you like twenty receptions, I think I'd go a little higher in the yards, two hundred yards, and maybe two touchdowns. I think that's a that's a good rookie year, all things considered. I could buy that, and obviously he could, you know, he could blow it out of water, depending on, uh, you know, I it, 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 like like we mentioned in the podcast, you know, earlier this week, you know, it, it's it's easier to project him hitting a twenty percent number than probably any other uh, draft pick, just because of the sheer fact that. You're gonna have a lot of three wide receivers, and mm-hmm. he's your highest draft pick. And you know, it just takes one hamstring injury for two weeks, and he's on the field for, you know, eighty snaps. You know, right, that, that right. kind of thing. All right, to go back to the other um, lesser known receivers, yeah, Switzer. Not a whole lot to be said there, other than do you think Switzer's gonna make this team? If you had to guess today, do I think Switzer will make the team? Yep. <sighs> I'm 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 I am i do not want to I don't want to be asked that question right now yet. I, I just, <laughs> I'm gonna go. I'll answer it. I'll go yes, especially in a year where you want a veteran guy as much as people dislike him who can wear a couple different hats. I think he makes it. I'm trying not to let my bias get involved here, and it's damn hard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because uh, a lot of people will just of course say no because they just don't want what's right. Uh, and that's where my bias is pulling me right now. Uh, man, he's got a you know. And, and it shouldn't it shouldn't come down to just uh, uh, being besties with uh, with Ben Roethlisberger, but I think that might play a little bit of a role in it. You know, just the, the trust factor in, and you you hit on it as well too. Who is who is who is the best slot on this team? Not big slot. Right. I mean, I think I think Claypool might be the best big slot. Right now, and he ain't even taking a snap. Yeah. Back, back up. But who's the best kind of shifty, you know, mm-hmm. guy in it? Unfortunately, yeah. it might be Switzer, right? Yeah, just not a lot of competition. I guess you could go with a Quadri Henderson type. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just you know, he's a veteran guy. He kind of knows what's going on. And you want your backup receivers to be Claypool plus Kane plus some other young guy potentially that uh, all these guys are trying to pick things up on the fly. I mean, that you might want to add a different type of receiver and a, a veteran receiver in that room as well. If you did add one, it would be one that give you slot more slot potential. Yeah, yeah, and we'll see who even lines up in the slot. So that that's the that's the deal on Switzer. Not a whole lot more needs to be said about him. Uh, you mentioned Anthony Johnson from Buffalo. There's uh, Saeed I Black- think he might be probably the. I think Anthony Johnson might be the best kind of all around jack of all, uh, master of none kind of guy down there on the depth chart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just I don't know. I mean, he's, he's got he's got a good body type. He's a big dude, but he's also in a room with a lot of big guys. A lot of the guys in this room are for two hundred plus, and so I don't know if that makes them as stand out ish as it would in other places. Uh, the Penn State kid, obviously, probably your one of your you know darker horse, deeper guys, right? Yeah, I've always been intrigued by Saeed Blacknall. He's been a vertical threat. I mean, he's not been a high volume guy, even at Penn State, but he's been a guy that's created a big place. He's kind of done that at every step in, in, in some form or fashion. And I think he's someone that will look very good in a practice setting when you're like 6'2, 200 plus, who runs, I think, like the low 4'4s four or high 4'3s in that kind of setting. You're probably going to make some plays. So I expect to hear some sort of buzz about a spectacular catch, a great you know vertical threat that Blacknall looks like in, in, in camp. What does Deion Kane do well? 
I think it was just impressive, even in, in very limited action, just how quickly he kind of picked things up and got in the Steelers system and made some plays. I mean, that's just tough to do as a young guy coming over from the Colts, you know, gets to play a little bit with them, ends up on the practice squad, the Steelers poach him. So just being able to make that transition is tough. I mean, he's got obviously the, the triangle numbers, the, the height, you know, the weight, speed kind of guy, someone that can be a vertical threat, a willing blocker. Um, so I think he's an interesting guy just because you don't have too many guys who profile like him in the world. I view him as as one of those players that uh, has the ability to make the tough catch look easy, but the easy catch look tough. Mm-hmm. So you're saying consistency with him is what he's got right. to work on, right? Yeah. And and you know he's he's known to 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 put the ball on the ground, you know, drops. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, Amar Doba still here, former high pick of the Seahawks. Um, not a whole lot of insight with him. He's kind of bounced around, didn't really work out in Seattle. And we'll see if he can kind of rebuild his value in Pittsburgh. Yeah, I think he uh, practiced squad material for sure, possibly. Mm-hmm. And then Quadri Henderson, local guy, pit guy. He's been in a Steelers camp before, so it's not going to be new to him. Much different body type than these other guys we're talking about. Smaller, shiftier guy. I can't remember if he played much in the slot, actually. Okay, you would think he did. But I think he actually played some extra receiver uh, in his training camp. But someone that can try to make some noise in the return game if there's an opportunity for that. Okay. So that's the receiver group. Um, you think to keep five or six? It's kind of like based on obviously just who plays well. and Someone deserves to be that six, but what, what, what do you think they're leaning? I would lean to five. Yeah. And so you would have your top four, obviously your t- starting three, Claypool, and that fifth being who? <laughs> This is my roundabout way of asking you about Switzer. Yeah, that's that's where I'm at. Okay. Unfortunately. <laughs> we don't, I'm, so you don't, I'm, you, I'm you, not committing. I'm, I'm punning. Not, <laughs> I like that. It, it, I like that it's, it's a fifth wide receiver. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I mean, it, it, it's hard. It, it's hard because of the short. And look, I think short preseason. I mean, the short and everything now, you know, uh, Going back to my 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 roster prediction, my my initial fifty three, I left. I think I left Switzer off, right? Uh, who did I have as? Do you remember who I had as the fifth on there? Did I even keep? Did you have Black though? I think you had. I think I think I might have. Yeah, I think I might might have. But the, the problem is, is now, man, you're just gonna not gonna have a lot of time for these guys to pick a lot of this stuff up. You know, right. and, and, and a and chance impressed. to show themselves. Well, there's no preseason games. How do you make a roster if you have no right. preseason games? So obviously, I think that bodes well. I mean, uh, in the favor of a guy like Switzer, right? Yeah, it does. Here's just here's the six you kept back in was this early May when you did your your roster. Well, that's Juju like a lifetime ago, it right? Now. Really does. De- Juju, Deontay Johnson, James Washington, Chase Claypool, Deion Kane, and Saeed Blacknall were your mm. six. Mm. You sticking yeah. with that? No. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough for these young guys. The uh, the oldest receiver on this team is Darbo at 26. It's kind of crazy. Mm. Very young. I think mean, Switzer is Switzer's still 25. I thought he was older than that. Mm. Okay. So there you go. All right, good discussion on the receivers. That finishes up our offensive preview for training camp slash preseason, whatever preseason there is at least. We'll flip over to the defense for uh, the next show. All right, what else do we have? I think that was everything. We can get some reader emails and close out the show. All right, uh, let's see here from Richard Hudspeth. Uh, good day, David Knox. Thank you for your reliable content, making us a little smarter surrounding the Steelers every show. Before I ask this question, in no way am I advocating it or believing the organization will do it, but just wanted to get another perspective. If the Steelers missed the playoffs for a third straight third straight year, would that be the point to move on from Tomlin? Is If not, where is that point? Yeah, I understand the question. To miss three in a row, when was the last time the Steelers missed uh, the playoffs three straight years? Not in the Tomlin uh, era. Yeah, not in the Tomlin era. Doesn't happen twice. Twice with the back-to-back eight and eight years. I mean, probably, probably go back to early 2000s with that, sometime in the 90s. So I, I would it, think he would get a mulligan, you know, uh, and people will say, well, he's, I had two mulligans already from missing the playoffs two years in a row. Uh, my, I, you know, I, I think it would depend what happens. Look, I mean, if this is sure. not an injury-filled – uh, season, uh, it would, it would definitely be tough to make, look, 
regardless of what your expectations are for the 2020 Steelers where we sit at right now, it has to be at least 10 and 6 or better, I would think, and thus a playoff team, especially with the extra playoff spot now. Uh, I don't see how it's I don't see how it's anything but a playoff team right now so if things didn't happen where we're going well you know uh, if 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 ben or these seven injuries didn't happen uh kind of thing yeah i mean look i mean uh, it it would it would be hard to make an argument (laughs) you know uh for tomlin i'll put it to you that way Mm mm-hmm yeah, it would be, especially when we've kind of couched the season and uh, as the Steelers should have a big advantage being that veteran stable team, unlike so many other clubs in in football um, that should give them an advantage, at least relative to the rest of the league, where they're more prepared and apt to deal with this set of circumstances than than a lot of other teams. You know, and I, I think you would also have to consider if indeed 2021 was going to be uh you know, let's say say the plan is for for that to be Roethlisberger's final season in the NFL. Do you really want that to be part of a new? You know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, would he even really want it to be part of a new re- regime and all? You know. Yeah, I I, I think if Tom Lewis was playoffs, he wouldn't get fired, but I think those calls would be obviously become a lot louder, and I think they'd be a lot more ju- uh, justified. Right. Uh, there there are a lot of reasons I think to think that that. Uh, a non-playoff appearance, you know, third straight one would not result in Tomlin losing his job. Now there, there were going to be cries. It'd be hard, it'd be tough to defend that, but I would think that that would be the outcome of it. If that makes sense, would be Agreed. him at least playing, playing the 2021 season. Agreed. Right. Yeah. Unless Ben were to retire after 2020 and just hangs it up. Then that uh, could be the thing that changes it. Okay, let's see here. From Ian McCullough, dear David Knox, do you think the Steelers will go for two more often this year due to the additions of red zone threats like Ebron and Claypool, as well as reduced crowd noise so Ben can call more audibles at the line of scrimmage? Uh, number two, has Alex watched the Blues Brothers yet? Get it on the list. Uh, thanks for the ter- uh, terrific off-season coverage. You know, when it, when it comes to, uh, uh, Ian, when it comes to uh, the two-point conversion, I think it's more of a feel thing with, with, with Tomlin, too. And I think you're more apt to maybe see that you know, if they jump on t- top early in games, you know. Uh, I don't know if it, it would be more inclined to happen just because of red zone threats like Ebron and Claypool and reduced crowd noise. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, they were really aggressive doing it a couple of years ago. Right. I know why they, they didn't do it last year, but even in 2018, they, they, that, that number kind of fell off. I don't know if because it was less of a surprise to teams or, as you said, it, it's very much a Tomlin gut thing to do. So I, I don't think – I'm with you, Dave. I don't think the additions of Claypool and Ebron makes it any more likely, but maybe we'll see some more of it. And no, I have not watched Blue Brothers, Blues Brothers, so uh, sorry. Man, you got to get that uncut. Fantastic. Fantastic movie. Uh, uh but yeah, look, I I don't think it would be a result of of, of you know I, I think it's just a uh, Tomlin having a feel for the situation here. I think we could see a more aggressive Tomlin a la 2017 2018 you know in, in that area. But I, I I wouldn't think it would be because of Ebron and Claypool or okay. or reduced crowd noise if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh let's see here. What else do we have? Uh, Let's see. Deshaun Campbell writes in, what's up, guys? My question for you guys are, one, if there's no college football season, how does the Steelers approach the draft? If one, I know the usual, I know they usually draft underclassmen. Do you think they would take a more senior approach this year? Guys with years under under their belt. Also, what does the college do with guys who need this third year of eligibility like Justin Fields to even be in the draft, or is it just based off your school grade level, man, Deshaun, I I don't, I haven't even begun to, to, to try to think about any of what you just asked there. So, (laughs) uh, I really don't have, I don't, I don't really, I don't have any answer for you, Deshaun. I mean, I think there's just so many unknowns right now, and I'm not sure, you know, obviously if, 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 if the season's even shortened, uh, you, you better have, you better have good scouting, and I'm sure the Steelers do on some of these underclassmen, uh, there. Uh, I, I think it could lead to, yeah, a more seniorish 
uh, approach to the draft. But man, a lot of questions that you asked, Deshaun, they're good questions. I just, I just don't have answers for them. Same. I wish I did. No one does right now. Hopefully it's a bridge we don't have to cross, but it is possible. Um, I think, yeah, I think it would be more senior late. It was more senior late in this year. I know Colbert just said that was a coincidence, not their intention, but I think that had some role in the lack of, you know, scouting and information on some of those underclassmen. So um, I don't think it's a total coincidence. Yeah, I think it would be more senior thing. And how would college football determine eligibility? Could, could they kind of give those guys a pass and say this year counts anyway, so you can go to the draft? I think they probably would do that, but... Again, that is stuff way above my pay grade. Yeah, uh, you know, come come after us again, Deshaun. Maybe middle of the season, assuming things are going uh, okay. There, I just man, I it's enough of a guessing game right now. What's going to happen in the NFL in the season? I I, I have not even you know kind of started thinking ahead like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know what the world's going to look like two weeks from now, let alone you know in April. Uh, this one from Bryce. Hey guys, uh, let's see. I can't believe it's already July and camp is right around the corner. Uh, I know we've talked about James Connor's limitations, but let's talk about his strength. If he's fully healthy, what are the top three things he does very well that make him a potential pro bowler? What are the best parts of his game? Uh, I think just overall understanding First, first of all, I think he's, he, he's very, very comfortable when he's on the field. I think pass protection is one of the things that he does probably better than people uh, give him credit for at this time. Uh, his ability to catch the ball out of the backfield, nowhere to be on, on the field is a plus from him outside of not actually carrying the football. Yeah, I think his overall power and toughness are admirable. Obviously, he's a bigger bank and he plays at that size and his overall just run demeanor. He's got a very, you know, clear downhill type run style. He doesn't dance. He knows the type of back he is and he plays to that style for better or for worse. And so I think all the things you said and yeah, just that that power that the tough guy to bring down and someone that's more explosive for for a guy of his size too um, which allows him to get more 20 plus yard gains than than you might expect i got how about good nose is it too generic to say good nose for the end zone no i think that works again that goes back to like the run demeanor style he's just downhill plowing ahead and uh yeah dude produces uh the you know look uh, ESPN's releasing their top ten you know at positions and obviously uh, James Conner was not in top ten but I think he was like the third honorable mention overall that's not surprising there look the big question uh, you know uh, about James James Conner going into this this season is can he stay on the field yeah. uh, if he can I think. There, and I wrote. I, I ended the uh, the post on this uh, on, on Thursday. Is is I, I like the potential of him maybe cracking the top ten a year from now, albeit probably in a different uniform. Uh, but uh, I, I fifteen hundred. I think fifteen hundred total yards from scrimmage is a, a distinct possibility for Connor in two thousand twenty uh, if he can play. You know, if he can stay on the field, look, I mean, obviously if he plays all 16 games, uh, which really seems like way out there right now. Uh, I mean, he could possibly approach 2000 total yards from scrimmage. Yeah, he could. Yeah, I think he's borderline right around top 10 talent in football. Um, I would also say just, you know. You're comfortable with him moving him around the formation too. That's something he really developed over uh, his, his rookie year to his sophomore year was being more more versatile. So yeah, the talent is there. It's all about health. And he should have every opportunity to prove it. You know, uh, now if you get in, you know, you start worrying week nine, week ten. You know how all that stuff start adds up on him, and that's when he's had his problems, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I should, shouldn't should speculate like this, and this is a very good question for Dr. Mel, and this is, again, very much above both our pay grades, but is he at any higher risk for COVID or, or COVID you know, severity complications being someone who battled cancer? Is there a higher risk associated with that? I don't know, I, and that's way above my, my, my pay grade. Now, I know that she said in, uh, that injury prone and, and, right. and the Not issues. related. Right, the issues with uh, that he's had in the past with with uh, the, the uh, Hodgkins and all like that uh, is is no, no relation. Right, you know? which I which yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. But I do wonder. I I, I don't know, but I just wonder if he's at a a higher risk person. Uh, he's not running around with a mask on a lot, <laughs> at least from That's his. True. 
you know, and and look, I'm not going to judge a guy just by what he posts on his social media uh, accounts about about not wearing a mask. I mean, he's been down there working at 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 Bomberito's performance, you know, uh, place down there in in South Florida with Le'Veon Bell and 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 Jalen Samuels and and obviously a lot of other players and all like that. And I mean, look, I mean, the the, the guys put in the work this offseason. He is not one of the guys where you think, oh, this guy hasn't put in the work. You know, him, mm-hmm. and, him and Juju both, uh, you know, and and Ebron and, you know, Steven Nelson. There, there's enough uh, evidence, I think, out there. These guys have been out there working. Mike Hilton, well, you want to talk about a guy that's silently working out there, uh, at least judging, you know, and, and once again, it's dangerous to judge guys just by what they do on social media posts. But uh, Mike Hilton sure seems to be putting in a lot of work this offseason, too. Yeah, well, he's got that big payday coming up, so. There you go. All right. Uh, number two, right now, do the Steelers actually have the best safety tandem in the AFC North? Hmm. Um, well, let's see what else you got. Who's, who's the, the Ravens got with over there with uh, 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 Earl Thomas? Earl Thomas. Well, yeah, they lost Jefferson. So who's starting? That's that, who's is the, that really a loss? <laughs> yeah, fair point. Um, yeah, who's the um, – would be the other Ravens safety right now. I'm blanking on that. And Cincinnati, you got Jesse Bates and Sean Williams and That's Cleveland. That's a bad one. That's a good one. Uh, Sean Williams pretty underrated player. And then Cleveland, you have Demarius Randall and who? Let's look at our lads. Looks like Chuck Clark and Earl Thomas uh, right. uh, with the Ravens. Okay, yeah. Um, Clark's kind of a boxier. He was playing some dimebacker stuff for them. Um what do they have in, in, in Cleveland? Who's, who's opposite of Randall? Am I blanking on there? Uh, in Cleveland, who is it? Uh, it Hold is uh, – oh, Carl Joseph. Oh, okay. Yeah, they signed him this, this offseason. It's Joseph and, and they, they they anticipate Delpit, right? Delpit and Oh, Joseph. where'd Demarius Randall go? He, he's gone? Yeah, he's gone, My, ain't he? Where did he go? Uh, oh, he's with the Raiders. Okay, so they flipped him. So Joseph is now in Cleveland. Okay, so that's a that's a pretty new group there. So it wouldn't be Cleveland, obviously. It would not be uh, Cleveland. Uh, I I I I dare say uh, I would probably rank them: Bengals, Steelers, Ravens, Browns. Mm. Yeah, Bengals is is an underrated one for sure. I would. I don't know if the upside with that group is as high though. I'm I'm going to sound a little biased, but I'm going to go. Steelers, Ravens, Bengals, Browns. Hmm. I mean, Minka, I think, tops everybody. This is that top. Daniel Earl Thomas is really good, but I'm still going to go with Minka. Okay. I, I would definitely have the Steelers top two. I mean, who do you think is a better safety, Earl Thomas or Minka Fitzpatrick? At their stages of their careers right now, probably Minka. Yeah. Right. And so – and did you have the Steelers above had, Baltimore in your ranking? Yeah, I had the Steelers okay. above Baltimore. I just I think Cincinnati might be I, because you hit on it. I think the other safety over there uh, uh, in Cincinnati is a little bit uh, uh, underrated. Yeah, but I don't know if that underratedness uh, leaps over how obviously good Minka Fitzpatrick is. But I think I think the Steelers are right there in, yeah. in, in the in the in the division, right? Yeah, I think the top three are close. I'm sure every fan of your team, Steelers fans would say they're number one, and Ravens fans would say they're number one, and Bengals fans would say the same. But, um, yeah, good question. In terms of route running, give us your ranking of the Steelers' wide receiver from best to worst. Of the current receivers? Yeah, we'll do the top three. Top three uh, in terms of route running. Deontay, Juju, James Washington. It's exactly the same way I would go. I don't think it's close either. Yeah, I think that's a pretty easy I one to answer. A, I think that's a slam dunk question right there. Uh, Bo Lawson's upset with uh, hearing 25 minutes of Mahomes talk on on the on the podcast. Uh, I'm sorry, Bo. You know? uh, let's see here if I got anything else on here. I think that's it. I think I think we've knocked out the questions there, Alex. All right, anything else for us here? Nope, I think it's everything. We will get back at it Tuesday and hopefully bring you some better news. 
All hard right. to come by lately. All right. Uh, in the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter at Steelers Depot. Follow Alex on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and you want to donate to the cause, please do and go to SteedersDepot.com. Hit the donate button up right navigational bar. Also, if you'd like an ad free version of SteedersDepot.com, go to SteedersDepot.com. Hit the ad free button up right navigational bar uh, for $25 for one calendar year. You can have an ad free version of the site. Uh, that's been very popular there uh, as well. So until Tuesday, actually until Monday night, we uh, tell people what we do on Monday night, Alex. Yeah, we have our Monday night live stream over on my YouTube channel. You can just search my name, Alex Kazora, find the channel, subscribe to it so you can uh, see the notification. We go live, though, 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern time for about an hour, uh, answering any and all of your Steelers questions. So it's always a good time. Have a good turnout and looking forward to that on Friday. And by the way, the Jaguars just announced seat uh, capacity 25% for each home game this year, which is probably about the norm for Jacksonville. But uh, that's, <laughs> yeah, uh, not, 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 not much no to change. do there unless, uh, unless Steeler fans are coming to town, right? All right. There you uh, go. So 25% in Jacksonville, though. Uh, all right. Uh, so in the meantime, until we meet again, have a great weekend. And as always, thanks for listening to the terrible podcast with Dave and Alex.